the Board Bia Quality Mark, ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards of traceability and care for the environment. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the new series of Home Chef and to the Viva Stadium, the first of an amazing collection of interesting locations where I'll be meeting the chefs who produce good food for large numbers of people and they don't come much larger than this. Very soon, 52,000 people will fill this stadium to watch Leinster play Munster. Behind the scenes, a team of 85 chefs working in 11 kitchens will serve everything from hot dogs to a full three-course meal to thousands of fans, as well as the press, the guards and the stadium staff. I'm going to find out more about the food operation here, cook with the head chef and meet a nutritionist who's responsible for feeding the teams after the match. I love sport and I'm particularly interested to see what players eat before a big match like today. I'm joined here with Catherine, who's the nutritionist from the Munster team. Catherine, you're very welcome and thank you for coming along. Thank you very much. What have the players eaten already today? Well, the requirements on a day like today are different to what they would have in a training day. So because carbohydrate is the preferred fuel source for exercise, they need to ensure that they have adequate carbohydrate in the build-up to the game. So the focus for the meals today would have been to make sure they had plenty of carbohydrate. At breakfast time this morning, between 8 and 9, they would have had the option of dry cereals or porridge, um, along with things like beans or scrambled eggs, plenty of bagels and toast. At 12.30, they had a pre-match meal, which was bolognese, plenty of whole wheat pasta. The bolognese was 95% fat-free, the lean mince. Um, then before we left the hotel at the three o'clock they would have had their pre-match meal which really was where we're focusing on a lot of carbohydrates. There would have been a choice of either chicken or fish and I'd say about 70% of the players opt for chicken and with that they may have rice, pasta, sweet potatoes, mashed potato. It's really a lot of carbohydrates they have at that stage. And after the match what do they eat? After the match the requirements are slightly different. What mm -hmm. you're aiming to do is replete what they've used up. So if you think of any exercise that you may have done, through sweat you would have lost fluids and electrolytes and through the exertion of the sport you're going to have lost carbohydrates. So the focus is on putting in what you've lost. Um, in order to ensure that you recover well and repair any minor niggles or tears, you're also hoping to include protein. So the strategy that we have in Munster Rugby is before they leave the dressing rooms, they would have had recovery shakes, um, muffins or brownies that have a very high protein content, fruit, fruit juices, electrolyte drinks to take on board. And we'd follow that then within about half an hour of having come off the pitch with their post-match meal. And that kind of varies. The person in charge of catering at the Viva Stadium is Martina Flood. And I asked her how many people she expected to cater for today. We would cook for approximately 25,000 people through our 34 food kiosks. Additionally to that, we would have approximately 400 guests that we would cook for in our self-service carvery, up to 200 guests in our pre-booked restaurant. Across all of our hospitality levels, up to 3,000 guests across those levels, uh, obviously offering a, an array of menus. On top of all that, we have our 1,100 staff that we feed and 1,500 people who work behind the scenes that we also serve on match day. And they would be our guardee, our stadium stewards, our event controllers, the media, the emergency response teams, and also the team players. We have 34 food kiosks in total across the stadium and we work with quality assured Irish meat providers. They work with us to devise specific recipes for our burgers and our hot dogs. So the beef burger is absolutely 100% beef and we serve about 4,000 of them on a match day. Our hot dog is actually an Irish sausage and it comes from Hodgins Foods in Cork. And we would serve about 5,000 of those on a match That's day. That's incredible. Our chef brigade is very big on a match day. You've How mentioned many? We could have up to 85 chefs working. They're doing the work on the day, obviously. However, the key to dealing with such large numbers is planning and preparation. The planning can start from a number of months out and the preparation for the food is all done roughly about three days before a match such as this one. Uh, we would probably have about 14 chefs 
planning and preparing menus, pre-ordering is becoming quite popular and an in thing to do. And within the last year, we've introduced a pre-order app. It allows the guests to log on to the app. They can pre-order their meals, their food and their drink, and they can have a ready for collection at half time. Now I'm looking at the menu here and I'll tell you, it has to say it's mouth watering. In this <coughs> restaurant alone, how many people would be fed here today? Today there's going to be 350 people served here. On a typical match day in our hospitality restaurants, we would serve up to 3,000 people. That could be menus of anything from fine dining, chef's tables, finger food, bowl food, tapas style menus, and anything bespoke in between. Well, yeah. I don't want to keep any longer because I know you people coming in here. Yes. <laughs> it's mind boggling the whole operation and I really want to thank you for having me here in Home Chef. So you have a great day, Nevin. This goat's cheese salad is one I regularly make at home and I really enjoy it. In the restaurant, we serve it three different ways, the goat's cheese. One in the crispy crumb, which I'm going to show you now. One is a panna cotta and one is a little pate. So it's hot and cold. I love that sensation. Serve with some pickled beetroot. But this one is a very, very simple dish that you can make well ahead. You store it in your fridge and also you can freeze the goat's cheese when it's crumbed. The one I'm using here is the Curleggi cheese. It's made about 40 minutes from the restaurant and it's really, really good. So whatever local goat's cheese you have, use it. It's absolutely delicious. So we're going to start off making the crumbs. It's very, very simple. We have a hard goat's cheese here, but this is a soft goat's cheese, which I'm going to use and it's really good in the crumbs. So what I've done first of all with the crumbs is just blended some stale breadcrumbs in the food processor with some paco crumbs. Paco crumbs are dried breadcrumbs. You'll get them nearly in every supermarket or Asian shops. We're gonna put in some sesame seeds, plenty of these. And these are the white sesame seeds. And then to add great texture is some toasted hazelnuts. Now you can use walnuts, but hazelnuts are wonderful. So how do we toast hazelnuts? In the oven or in a dry pan? They take about eight to 10 minutes until the skin is golden brown. And then what you do is put them into a tea towel and you rub them really firm and all the skin comes off. It couldn't be easier. So I'm gonna chop these nice and small and I'm gonna keep a couple just for serving around the goat's cheese. So rocking the knife over and back, keep bringing it into the center. And then when you start to get them a little bit smaller, but they're not gonna rock all over the place. You just hold the knife and work a little bit faster. And you can make this crumb for even slices of chicken breast, little goujons, homemade goujons, or turkey breast, or even the humble pork chop works really well in these crumbs. Now, what I've done, I've kept a couple of hazelnuts roughly chopped just to sprinkle over the salad. This is gonna go into our breadcrumbs, using your big knife, straight into the breadcrumbs, and then we're gonna put the zest of some lemon. So just using the microplane, grate the lemon, so it's lovely and fresh, especially with the lemon zest. It works really well. Some herbs. I'm going to use a little bit of flat leaf parsley. And a bit of flat leaf parsley is gorgeous in the crumbs. You can use chives, tarragon works really well, or even basil. So gather it all up and just chop this nice and fine. Watch those fingers. Rock it over and back. And then just add this into your breadcrumbs. Just get a spoon and just combine everything together. And if you ever make cauliflower mornay, you do your cauliflower, white sauce, and these breadcrumbs, delicious. So we're ready to crumb our goat's cheese. I'm using these small little logs. Probably get four portions from this. Cut them nice and even. I'm gonna put them into flour, a little bit of seasoned flour, and then into some egg. Egg with a little bit of milk, egg wash, and then what we have is the breadcrumbs. What the flour does, it helps the egg stick and keeps the moisture in the goat's cheese and then make sure it's coated all over. So I have one egg and just a little splash of milk, just whisk it together. Then we pop it into the breadcrumbs. So you keep one hand wet and then the other hand is dry for the breadcrumbs. Completely cover, press them in, roll them. How good does that look? You can see the texture from the nuts. So this technique is known as the pane. So seasoned flour, a little bit of salt in the flour, egg wash and then your breadcrumbs. So that's our cheese done. Wipe your hands. You can bake them in the oven. I find the best way is to deep fry them. And this small little fryer is set at 170. We have some rapeseed oil. If you're gonna bake these in the oven, at about 180, and they'll take about 12 minutes. And at this stage, when they're crumbed, you can store them in your fridge for up to two or three days, or you can freeze them. So that's why this dish can be made ahead. These cook very, very quickly in the fryer. Have a little plate. I'm using a little Pyrex dish with some kitchen paper. Now. Just check the center of them. They are hot, but they're soft. I don't want to overcook them or they will burst. Be really careful. Oh, wow. Yeah, look fab. So that's them there. Ready to serve up. I'm going to show you a very, very quick dressing. Just let them sit there. We're going to use some garlic rapeseed oil. We're going to 
use some lemon. So we've already used the zest of the lemon. So let's use some of the juice and the squeeze of that. Some black pepper, works really well with goat's cheese. Pinch of salt, add in the roughly cut hazelnuts in here. Quick little whisk, finish it with a couple of herbs, lovely little bit of parsley here. No need even to chop it, just simply tear it with your hands so it's lovely and fresh. So we're ready to serve up, we just need to get our apple, cut it in quarters, remove the core. And you can do this with a, it's a Japanese mandolin, but just do it by hand. And watch your fingers, try and do it as thin as you possibly can. So you curve your fingers, now that should be lots there. So, ready to serve up. Bring over your plate. Get your apple and just fan them around the plate like this. So it looks very, very simple. You're gonna impress your guests or family and friends, whoever you're cooking this for. Bring over your goat's cheese and be careful because we've only crumbed them once, they're very soft. So just lift them up and they're kind of spongy in the middle. Look at that, delicious. I think you need the two of them. We're gonna get our dressing. This is the hazelnuts, which are just roasted off. And the rapeseed oil, a little bit of black pepper and some lemon, and then some salad. So you can use rocket. I'm gonna use some of the lovely salad leaves that we grow in our own garden. And remember to put the dressing on at the last moment. For a little bit of color, look at these beautiful edible flowers. Some nasturtiums, a little viola, and then some garlic chives. Now you will impress whoever you cook this for. And that's my crispy goat's cheese with the hazelnut crumb and some apple. Coming up in part two, I'll show you a great way to cook fish and I'll be back at the Viva Stadium to cook some hearty meatballs, ideal post-match food. The board be a quality mark, ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards. The board be a quality mark, ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards. Like so many fish recipes, you can use a variety of fish in this recipe. For example, hake works really well, whiting and haddock. What I'm gonna show you how to cook is some sea bass and get the skin lovely and crispy, the way I like to cook fish. So the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna crisp up some bacon, use a little bit of oil, and this is gonna be for a nice little garnish, it's like a cassoulet. You can use chorizo, I'm using smoked bacon. It's smoky, so it's really, really tasty. Cut the bacon into small little cubes or lardons. It's roughly the same size as the beans, which I'm going to use and heat through. Now, tiny bit of butter, it's gonna give lovely flavor to this. I wanna get this nice and crisp, so it gives great texture and flavor. Just keep moving it around, get a little bit of color on it. While that's cooking, I'm gonna talk about the sea bass. So these are sea bass fillets. Now they're scaled and I've just pin boned them. You go to your local fishmonger and they will happily do that. Now I'm gonna show you the technique of cooking the sea bass, which is nice and crispy. Heat my pan, a little bit of rapeseed oil. First of all, put little incisions in the skin. So you press, put little incisions here. It gets the skin really crispy and stops the fish from curling up and cooks underneath the skin. But you must make sure that it's scaled. Dry it off with kitchen paper. Really important. So there's a couple of stages into this, but it is very, very easy. We are going to just put a little bit of butter onto the pan. Let that foam up. Put the sea bass skin side down. So we've dried it off. Just place it on like that, and then we season it when it goes on the pan. A little bit of salt, a little bit of black pepper, and then turn it down. We want to let this cook for about three to four minutes on the skin side so it gets really, really, really crispy. Now you can, use a fish slice to press it down. Dry off the skin, that's so important because it's the moisture that sometimes catches the sea bass and makes it stick. Let's move on to our cassoulet. Take out the bacon and smell it just onto some kitchen paper. So this can be done ahead. So for the cassoulet, I'm using the same pan that I crisped up the bacon. Traditionally a cassoulet is always with beans and maybe Toulouse sausage or chorizo, but we're using some nice smoked bacon. A little bit of veg stock. So you're deglazing the pan there. A little bit of butter, so you're creating a nice emulsion. So you whisk this every so often, just have a little look at the sea bass. It's cooking beautifully, the butter will help the color and of course the flavor. Now this is a great thing to have in your store cupboard. These are mixed beans, they're already cooked. So that's the beauty about this. We have some chickpeas, some haricot beans, and also some brown beans. Warm this through. So back onto the fish. 
using the fish slice. Flip that over, beautiful. Crispy skin. And the beautiful thing about fish, it cooks really fast, it's so nutritious, it's good value. I would eat fish about twice a week. This is the way I love it. Crisp skin, no bones, but the moist flesh underneath, that's the secret into it. Okay, a little bit of salt into our cassidy. Black pepper. So our bacon is already warm, so I'm just gonna pop that back in. And then we're gonna put some herbs. So you can put lots of different herbs into it. Tarragon works well. I'm gonna use some chives, flat leaf, parsley, or basil. So just get some chives, chop them really nice and fine. And I always like to finish my sauces or dressings with herbs at the last minute. The secret into cooking the sea bass is to keep the pan, have it really hot first of all, and then keep it on a low heat. So you're cooking it through. Chives go in, and then a little bit of flat leaf parsley here. Just rip off a little bit of that. And I'm gonna chop this. Now I'm gonna switch the, the pan underneath the fish. This is how quick it cooks because it's a thin little fillet of the sea bass, and I think you need two of the fillets for a main course. If you want this, this is a nice little starter. One fillet is absolutely plenty. So, in goes the herbs. Get a large spoon, and we're gonna stir this through. And then taste it. Make sure that you're happy. The beans are already cooked. Mm, lovely, nice texture there from the, all the little beans. Happy with that, ready to serve up, to arrange the beans just in the center of the plate. So a nice kind of pile of these. Lift off the sea bass, and then just arrange this on the side. So I'm serving two of the fillets, and then serve with a little bit of salad. So I have some rocket and some microgreens, and just over to the side. Baby salad, and then we have some microgreens. A little bit of coriander works really well in this dish. And then some edible flowers. Finish it with just a little drizzle of olive oil over the top. A little bit of black pepper. And how quick was that? That is the sea bass with the cassoulet of beans and smoked bacon. This recipe is great with lots of varieties of fish and the technique of nicking the skin gives great results every time. Pork meatballs are a favorite in my house. And it's a great recipe, this. If you have a large group coming to your house, you can make the sauce and also the pork meatballs a day or two ahead. The first thing I'm gonna do is to make the sauce. Heat my induction, good splash of the rapeseed oil. Let that warm up. This is one large onion, which is finely diced. Half's gonna go into the pork and half is gonna go into the sauce. Some red chili, so if you'd like it nice and spicy, which I do, you can put a full chili or else you can cut it a little bit back if you don't like a lot of spice. Ginger. Lots of root ginger, peel it, we're gonna grate it into the pot, so we are. So the first thing I'll do is just simply sweat off the onion into the pot, make sure the pan is nice and hot. Nice sizzle there. So I'm gonna use in half of this. A Little bit of chili, and this is some red chili, so when you're preparing the chili, make sure you wear gloves, and then some root ginger. So this is the base for the sauce. It's a lovely coconut curry sauce, which works really well with the meatballs. Now we are gonna put some root ginger into the meatballs. So I've just slightly turned down the induction, just let this sweat for a moment. Into this I'm gonna put a little touch of garam masala, which is a lovely Indian spice. Two teaspoonfuls of high red curry paste. So you're gonna to start to cook out your spices. Bring the temperature up a little bit. And into this now I'm gonna add in a can of chopped tomatoes and some coconut milk. So the tomatoes go in first. So this is the base for your coconut curry. Now hear that sizzle, it's always a good sign. Now stir this through, just to mix through the curry paste and of course the garam masala. Coconut milk, and this is from Thai Gold, it's an Irish company. So the full can of coconut milk goes in here and then just stir this through. Now I'm just gonna bring this to the boil. I'm gonna let this simmer for about eight to 10 minutes. While this is on cooking, I can make my pork meatballs. So put the lid on and then just reduce that. So between one and two and the induction is fine. So the pork meatballs, these are fantastic. I'm using some quality assured Irish pork. We have just, it already minced. It speeds up the whole process. The other half of the onion, we used half the onion in the sauce, our chili, finely dice it. If you don't want to use chili, it's absolutely fine. You can use a little bit of sweet chili sauce. Grate some root ginger into it. So watch your fingers when you're doing this. Some breadcrumbs stale breadcrumbs, whiz them up in the food processor, one egg, 
And I think what's going to work well with this is a little bit of lemon zest. So you have the spice from the chili and the ginger, of course, and I'm going to put a little bit of the garam masala. So these are delicious. You could actually make these into a large burger. The garam masala goes in, and then the best way to do these is to wear gloves. Good pinch of salt, and a little bit of black pepper in there. So everything is in the bowl. So I'm going to make these into meatballs. So before I do that, let's have the induction on. Have it preheated, a little bit of oil. Okay, get the hands in there. So all your spices, just knee it like that. So make sure you just mix it all through. It just takes a couple of minutes. And then we just shape them. If you really want it to be particular, you could get a potato scoop, a small potato scoop. But listen, life is too short. It's always great value pork. And I think pork mince is sometimes a little bit forgotten about. So the pan is preheated, very important. Bring the meatballs over. And just what you want to hear when they go on is that sizzle. So I'm literally just going to seal these off. Start from the middle and just go right around the edges. We'll remove the gloves and let's have a little look at our sauce, which is simmering beautifully. And it's very important when you're making this sauce to cook out the spices. There's nothing worse when you make a sauce like this and you haven't cooked out the spices, there's a very raw aftertaste and it's not pleasant to eat. So just reduce it down. Nice simmer. Let's have a little look at these. Shake the pan. Gorgeous, look at that. Just turn them over. I love that flavor when meat caramelizes on the pan. Let these very, very gently cook for another minute. They won't be fully cooked. A little bit of salt and pepper. And a pinch of salt in here. And then we just mix this through. Now, so what I'm gonna do is just lift out the meatballs and put them in to the pot. And this is gonna keep them really moist, succulent. It's gonna cook them through. They don't take very long because they're not you know, a huge size. I'll just switch that induction off there. The lid goes on. And literally all we have to do is bring this to the boil and let this simmer for about eight to 10 minutes. After eight or 10 minutes, they should be cooked through and beautifully succulent. And that's the whole idea about cooking them in the sauce. The only thing I need to do is just to chop a little bit of coriander to stir that through. And it doesn't have to be too finely chopped. Sprinkle it all over, add so much freshness to it. And stir this in here. I love finishing sauces with fresh herbs like that. You think of a tomato sauce with basil, same with coriander. I'm gonna serve some rice, which we've just simply steamed, or you can serve with some mashed potato, it doesn't really matter. Get a nice big deep bowl and just spoon in the rice. So this little bit of basmati rice. I'm gonna bring over the meatballs. And I just wanna show you one, cook through, just using a small little spoon here. So we'll just cut it right into the center. falling apart. You can see the little bit of colour from the garam masala, but it's cooked through, it's succulent. And again, you need to serve about three of these for a main course, and then plenty of that lovely sauce. Look at that. So plenty of that. The last thing I'm going to do, some toasted flaked almonds, a little bit of texture on the top, and then just some fresh coriander. So that's a meal made very quickly. That's my pork meatballs with a coconut curry. Enjoy. In the next episode of Home Chef Fast, I'll be visiting the Irish Naval Services Base in County Cork to find out how the chef feeds a hungry crew away for four weeks at a time. Board Bia Quality Mark, ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards.